So I am also encouraged that this debate, which is investing in research for health, has, which has such a long history, he still has so many people willing to invest their time, effort, and resources in trying to develop new and innovative solutions to the three long-standing problems identified by many fora, namely financing, monitoring, and also coordination of research and development. These issues are not new, and they were recognized in, the, in establishing the constitution of WHO in 1948 which has a core function has to promote research and research priority building capacity so that countries they can, they can take responsibility for these efforts. In the subsequent more than 60 years, there have been numerous initiatives and commissions that have sought to address the problem. A recent WHO publication provides an overview of this development, and this is a well-known report of a consultative expert working group on research and development to meet health needs in developing countries. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the consultative expert working group on research and development, or CEWG, and its chair, Jonah Rottingen, for having re-energized the debate through a mixture of controversial and non-controversial proposition. Although many dissenting voices have rejected the idea of a binding legal agreement, the report has put a good question on the table. If not a convention, so what? And I believe that the search by the international community of an appropriate response, and especially by those who are not in favor of the convention. So an appropriate response to this what will move us forward anyway, much more than many of us, I think, are expecting. So where are we today, and what role is there for an international movement to bring these efforts together? Let me remind you of two very positive quotes. Well, despite the well-documented challenges, the R&D glass, while not quite full, is certainly not empty. The resources invested at a global level have grown significantly, as was earlier uh, mentioned by Donald. Uh, by Second, new models to drive innovation, so, so-called product development partnerships, or PDPs, the majority of them being supported by philanthropy, do have numerous products in their pipeline. There is no ample proof, but through several examples, that with the right combination of public and private partners, new products can be developed in the absence of a commercial market, leading to a genuine health impact. Although this particular success story has a tendency to be overused, let me refer to the development and subsequent introduction of an affordable meningitis A vaccine for Sub-Saharan sub Africa. I know a project very well as I led the original work under this 50 percent partnership with a US-based um, PAP NGO from its inception until the first vaccine introduction in, in Burkina Faso. So why was the project successful? Let me give you my reason, which because they, I think they they are of relevance to the broad debate. So what, what are those? Well, first, a clear health need, and also a recognition that there was no market force to develop a solution. So prioritization. Second, upfront involvement on the intended recipient, <coughs> African policymakers. Therefore, research ownership. Third, the money, and lots of it, was secured from the beginning to get us to the end. So, financing seen as a global public good. Fourth, good governance. Five, the right partners, and three, access to the best technical expertise for free. And finally, trust between the partners and communication, open communication all the time. However, of course, 
one swallow does not make mean spring. I don't know if you say this in English, in French, we say an hirondelle ne fait pas le printemps. And numerous challenges remain. We still know very little about the detail of research efforts at contribution at global level, measuring the extent of the so-called 90-10 gap remains as he used it to measure to, as much today as it was when it was coined in the 1990s by the Commission of Health Research and Development. It is clear that mapping coordination and funding, while often discussed separately, are in fact intrinsically linked. Without good data, effort at setting priorities and mobilizing resources in a coordinated manner remain fragmented. So what can be done? Today, I will choose to focus on those areas where I know there is broad agreement and hope that we can work together on what brings us together rather than focus on what divides us. So monitoring, there is a consensus about r and stakeholders but on development of a global health r and observatory as a valuable asset in order to monitor and analyze relevant information in this area. This could build on on national and regional observatories or equivalent function, they don't need to be called observatories, as well as ex on existing data collection mechanisms with a view to contributing to the identification of gaps and opportunities to uh, <coughs> It is a key part of a draft resolution that will be discussed by the World Health Assembly in May uh, very soon. After further consultation is needed, of course, on a future setting, the function could be organized on an online platform that would monitor and report on financial flow for global health R&D, integrate information of, of research and development financing flows with product pipelines and other resources that support innovation and access to health, provide information, reports, and analysis to inform policymakers, donors, and researchers, and also support capacity building in the governance of R&D and innovation for improved access. <clears throat> the information and data on the R&D observatory would inform R&D portfolio management, guide R&D priorities at say, setting at national, regional, and global level, and also benchmark progress and enable monitoring and evaluation of trends against national, regional, and global strategies. In, of course, in order to make this R&D observatory effective, it is urgent to develop a common ontology or classification of research in order to be able to easily compare and add line with line. So what are the main, uh, what are the main barriers to achieve this? I would say that we need to have incentives for the, uh, the countries themselves and in especially poor countries, to collect data on r &D. And we need to, to be clear that there is a value added for that in, in entering data that can be used by the global community. Therefore, in creating a global observatory, we need to consider both a bottom-up collection from national data and a top-down approach <coughs> using sustainable surveys like Virgin Finder, but more, um, more sustainable, I, say, I would say, in terms of financial requests for that. So the recent meeting held on behalf of WHO and by the Wellcome Trust in London on uh, building the stepping stone for observatory have come to a few conclusions that I'd like to really list only because of lack of time. First, build on what is there. Second, start small, but think big, what it could be at the end. Third, identify value added at all levels, otherwise the people who will not want to input data into the observatory. And fourth, get going. Now, don't wait. Grow and adapt as we go. So with this you know, short overview, I will really want to, to conclude and, and to say that um, indeed we, we are, for the time being, we are first, we, we don't know what the World Health Assembly will, uh, will decide on, uh, on the draft resolution that will be brought in, in, in face 
of uh, them for the for discussion. But we are currently uh, discussing monitoring, uh, prioritization, and financing. These three areas are like the Nelson's tools. And if we get them right, then like a three-leg stool, we will be stable in there, even stable, even in a most uneven population. Thank you very much.